Prepare for the extraction point. We've been briefed on all the important stories and events in the world of emerging information. Now, it's time to extract the data and turn it into action. Live from the SiliconANGLE studios in the heart of Silicon Valley, this is Extraction Point with John Furrier. Welcome to Extraction Point. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE.com and SiliconANGLE.TV. And my guest today on the Extraction Point is Doug Cutting, the founder of Hadoop. We're here at the SiliconANGLE studios in Cloudera, in the heart of Hadoop, which is, that's the office that commercializes Hadoop. Uh, Doug Cutting is going to talk about Hadoop, the founding of Hadoop, and kind of where it's going. And just a general update on the community. Doug, welcome to the Extraction Point uh, with John Furrier. Thanks very much, John. It's <laughs> great to be here. Um, you know, we sit next to each other at the same table when you're in town. You, uh, you actually work for Cloudera as an employee, um, and you're also the founder of Hadoop, one of the hottest uh, trends in tech right now. And uh, you also live in the vineyards uh, in uh, Napa. I, in uh, Napa I, live, Valley? I live up north. Uh, <laughs> I try not to get too specific about it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I don't consider myself the founder. I'm a founder of the project. I was, I was there when we were, were starting it out. Um, but, it, you know, it's really a, a collaborative effort. Uh, lots of people involved. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was one guy there. I was, uh, I think I'm, I'm identified with the project um, uh, because I was there from the start. Um, and I, I had the privilege of naming it uh, after my, my yeah. kid's stuffed elephant, uh, which gives me a certain amount of you're a, you're a figurehead for the for the whole project, and there are other founders. Let's go through and talk about the early days of Hadoop. I mean, obviously, you were a co-founder of Hadoop, but one of the principals behind it, obviously, and there were a lot of contributors. Talk about the early days of Hadoop um, for the folks out there and what Hadoop has become. So take us through the evolution of Hadoop, and Hadoop being the software that is powering this big data trend and or you know, unstructured data trend. So take us through the... Real sure, quickly, the sure. origins of Hadoop, you know, what was going on at the time? So, um, uh, I got started on this. Um, uh, I was working on a project called Nutch. Uh, we started Nutch in uh, 2002, 2003, something like that, um, trying to build an um, open source uh, web search engine. So, you know, uh, what Google and, and Bing and, and folks like that have, um, but all open source. Um, it was an ambitious effort, because those are, those are major works of software that take a lot of work to maintain. But, we are like, what the heck, why, don't, why not do one in, in open source? Um, and we knew from the start that um, in order to build something that big, uh, at the time I think people were saying there was you know, one billion web pages, now we say you know, 20 or 100 billion or more than maybe a few hundred billion, the numbers, numbers keep going up. Um, but still, a lot of data. Um, uh, more than you could store on a single hard drive, more than you can really store on a single server, or process especially on a, on a single server. Uh, so we knew it had to be a distributed solution from the outset. Um, I also knew from my work on Lucene doing full text search um, that that processing data at that at bulk data at that kind of rate um, wasn't necessarily the forte of uh, relational databases. Um, uh, in fact, in the early days of Nutch, we tried using um, relational uh, kinds of technologies using B trees and and whatnot um, uh, to um, keep track of the of the web pages that we were, were grabbing, and and they just couldn't keep up. Um, so the current tech was not there for you. I mean, Wasn't basically there. like, hey, you know, um, relational databases are great, structured data, a lot of tables, a lot of overhead. I mean, we just couldn't get the performance we needed. You know, we need, we wanted to. Um, the, the, so if you're crawling the web, for example, um, uh, every page uh, has a large number of outgoing links, and for each of those outgoing links, you have to look up and find out whether you've seen that page before or whether you need to crawl it or when you last saw it. So you need to do sort of a database lookup, um, and at the rate you can pull pages down from the net. You do the math and you look at the number of database accesses you need to do, and it, it gets to be really huge. Um, and um, so we needed some alternate way of, of handling this 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 big fat pipe of data that we were. That we and were what year was Hadoop reading. coming together at this point? Was it 2005? So so we we worked on it for a couple of years, um, and we had a we had a way of get everything every, everything distributed, and we could run it on maybe four machines, um, uh, and we, we sort of worked out these problems, and, and it would, in theory, all scale to hundreds or thousands of machines, but in practice, it was really hard, because there was a lot of manual steps. It wasn't all fully yeah. automated. The, 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 um, the algorithms um, and the data structures were designed to be um, uh, distributed, um, but, but having a, a real distributed system is, is another step. Um, and about that time, uh, so this would be um, 2000, I'm going to say four-ish. Um, uh, 
uh, maybe 2005, probably somewhere in there, um, Google published a couple of papers. Um, they published first one about a um, distributed file system, okay. the Google file system, GFS. Um, and then about a year later, they published this MapReduce paper. Um, and you put the two of those together, and um, they perfectly solved the problems they were having. They used the same algorithms, the same way of distributing that we were already doing in Netch, um, but they had a framework which automated all the hard parts um, uh, and, and, and just you know, made it so that you could easily scale without having, adding more people uh, manually monitoring things and moving things around, which is the way we were doing it with Netch. And so to me, it was like, that's what we need. This is obviously it. Um, and so uh, me and another fellow, Mike Caffarella, uh, primarily the two of us at this point, um, set about implementing uh, those. Um, and it took us a year or two. Um, and we had something that we could run. Was the Google code, did they contribute code at that time? No was code. it simply paper? They published paper. two papers. Got it. Um, and they didn't say a lot more about it than that. But the papers were you know, pretty clear um, yeah. uh, about, about what was going on. Um, uh, so um, uh, we started doing this. Um, and we got it to a point where it would run on 20 to 40 machines. Um, uh, I was working with the uh, Internet Archive. And they had some uh, clusters of, of 20 to 40 machines that I would run things on. Um, Mike was working at University of Washington doing some research for his uh, Where's he at now? Um, he's at, um, uh, oh boy, I'm trying to remember the name of it. It's, um, uh, Is he still at the university? He, no, he's at a different university. In, um, so he's uh, in academics still? He's in academics. He's, a, okay. he's an assistant professor. Um, I'm, I'm embarrassed that I'm blanking on the name. It'll come That's to okay. me. That's okay. That's all right. I just want to know if he's in the uh, company. Is he at Google? So did Google just kind of throw the papers out there? Did they get involved? And Yahoo you know, was the one who pretty much. So, you know. so at that point, we got to this point, and um, and it worked kind of, um, but there were also you started to realize that um, every uh, point where you do something that's distributed, every every time you have one machine touch another, um, there's a, an opportunity for uh, things to fail, um, and you need to successfully handle each of those failures. And it turns out, in a system, MapReduce is not horribly complicated, but it's complicated enough. And the, and the file system is, is ten, you know, designed to be very simple, but it's still complicated enough that there's lots of little ways things can fail you. And making sure that you handle all of those failures correctly is a lot of work. Um, and I began to realize that it was, it was a bigger job than two guys working part-time would ever be able to, you know, it would take us 10 years yeah. to get to the point where, where you could really run it on hundreds of thousands of machines so reliably. So where did it go from there? Yeah. So, so Yahoo then approached me um, and said, um, we like this. It looks like a great starting point. We have the same problem. Um, we, we need a platform to do this kind of, of computing on. Um, and you look like you've got a good start to one here. Um, would you like to come work with us? And, and uh, I said, great. Um, uh, and uh, As long as they, they knew it was they open source? Team. It was open source yep, at that it was, point? It was open source. Uh, it was at Apache at that point. Yep. Um, and uh, it was still part of Nutch. Um, so in January of 2006, I started working uh, at Yahoo. Um, we split this part of the of Nutch out into a new project, which we called Hadoop. Um, a number of Yahoo engineers got involved. Um, uh, most of them worked for a guy named uh, Eric Baldeschweiler, Eric, Eric 14, as he's known. Um, uh, Owen O'Malley, uh, Arun Murthy, um, uh, folks like that who were still very involved in the project. Are they still at Yahoo? Um, those and guys? those two, those three are still at Yahoo. Um, there's a lot of other people who we got to get you guys Yahoo on here on the Cube. Come into this, to the show here in Palo Alto. We'll get you on. Um, and uh, and the, so they had, they had a, a you know good impressive team of engineers that, that they, um, they they set onto this um, and uh, over the course of the next um, year to two years um, uh, it really did mature um, uh, we we you know figured it, we together got all these um, these different ways that things could fail and made sure that it did something reasonable um, and. Um, uh, before you know it, Yahoo was actually using it to process the whole web. Um, uh, you know, to hot process. Oh. What, uh, how, what year was that? Tens of uh, billions of how pages. How fast did it move from think, coming on board to processing the web at that point? Um, I think it was it, under two years um, uh, uh, before it was there. And uh, we also, at the same time, had it, uh, um, uh, I think Owen worked on this as well as Arun, um, getting it to um, uh, compete in this um, uh, international competition for sorting data. Sounds exciting, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the next Olympics. It's sport. better than quick sort, right? <laughs> That's right. Uh, <laughs> All you come um, size students it, out there. It won. It, it won. It yeah. was, a, was a, you know, the fastest system to be able to sort a, um, a terabyte uh, that, that year. Um, and so then it was, it was really on the map uh, uh, by, by 98 um, as being a, um, a technology that by could solve problems. 2008. 
sorry, 2008. 2008. I was going to say 98, yeah. <laughs> okay. Index the whole web at oh, that by point. Yeah. Um, uh, by 2008 yeah. um, uh, was, um, was really there scaling, running on thousands of machines um, uh, and, and be able to process the entire web. Um, there's still, you know, some other things that were And I think missing. Cloudera got funding, Almer bolted out uh, and became an EIR at uh, Excel. I think Hammerbacher was he still at Facebook at the time, and then you guys got funded. Cloudera, Cloudera got was funding. was founded, I believe, in two thousand and eight as well, around around the same time. Got it. Um, yeah. So the right uh, one had bolted out. Uh, I believe that's that's the case. Um, uh, and um, uh, so then, you know, we start to see. Where did Google come into all this? Because Google puts the papers out there. That's the catalyst for the innovation. You guys were using working on Nutch. Google puts out the the GFS and then the MapReduce papers. Mm -hmm. Basically, like, wow, this is like an inspiration things started clicking for you guys. Um, and then Yahoo picks up the ball, innovates from there, really gets it stable and grow and as a core product. Um, and Cloudera is for, is, does Google step into the equation at all during that p time uh, and use it or were they? Google used it for, um, uh, they encouraged its use at universities um, through various efforts. Um, they, they helped universities teaching courses. Uh, they helped universities um, uh, use, they set up clusters for universities to be able to use to teach courses. Um, uh, and so they certainly helped promote it. Were um, they contributing code at the time? They no. didn't really, com they had one, one intern who contributed some code, um, but not much. Um, I think they were concerned, uh, I think there were some legal concerns about um, having their engineers who um, could see everything that they had um, contributing to this project, which was close to areas where they held some patents and so on, and I, I don't okay. know the details. Yeah, um, why they business did. reasons. But, um, but they've definitely supported the project. Yeah, they um, did. They like having it out there. Um, uh, what I've heard, heard from people at Google um, that they really appreciate is that now they can hire people who already are familiar with this, this family of technologies and this way of thinking, um, uh, and they don't have to train everybody from scratch. It's, 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 it's really before. amazing, um, kind of intoxicating new computer science. I mean, if you think about it. So I mean hand it out to the universities, get them playing with, you know, unstructured data and big clusters with Hadoop. I mean, it's good, it's good for business for them. So, so what I've heard from Google is, um, uh, I, I don't know, you know, again, I don't speak for Google, so I'm, I'm yeah, surmising yeah. some things I here. can speak for Google. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, Google wants to get this out in front of everyone because it's good for their business. Good in computer science, students train, and, you know, Bill Gates talks about it at Microsoft, you know. But we need more computer science guys out there coding away. I don't know how much they hold this, this kind of technology as something that um, is, a, is a critical advantage that they have a, 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 their own implementation. But they also have some um, practical reasons um, that they that people have told me why it's difficult for them to open source things. Just the way their software is organized, um, uh, that it tends. And what to are be, those reasons? There's a lot of interdependencies in the way they, they structure things, um, and they get a lot of um, benefit from that in in their engineering to have everything. Uh, you mean kind of like building an OS? Um, kind of like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just uh, it's just it's just that they it's hard for them to extract. Yeah. Uh, GFS and MapReduce. I mean, yeah, yeah. it's a specific problem in this case, um, and and give those away without giving away uh, Gmail and web search. Yeah, yeah. totally um, makes which sense. Which they don't want to give those away because um, those are things which they consider you know proprietary yeah, technologies, um, and uh, and it's just technically hard. It would be a big investment and and not worth it to them. Yeah. Whether even if it were easy, whether they would, I don't know. That question doesn't come up because yeah, yeah. It, it's not something they can do. It makes sense for um, Google. They should protect the crown jewels. I mean, they got you know. Right. Outside of search, Gmail is, um, and you know Android are the two hottest products for them. So, but they've been very encouraging and, and yeah. uh, about this this work. I was just um, I just wrote a comment to a blog post about Google. How uh, you know a lot of the ex Googlers now are getting in and funding and doing startups. So, you know, they're taking over Silicon Valley at the startup level, where it's both funding and execution. So, you know, Google has a, has a very entrepreneuring mindset within the company. A lot of people are doing entrepreneurial things, which is a double edged sword for Google. This you know, creates right. more chaos. Right but gives, provides more energy, energy and, and uh, innovation. Cool, so Hadoop, you, great movement. A lot of people involved helping along the way. You had a, a wingman in Mike. Yahoo came in, Google initiated with the papers, gets it going, Yahoo picks it up, boom, you're at Yahoo. Cloudera gets formed. Now you have Cloudera commercializing the aspects of Hadoop. You have Apache Software Foundation managing the Hadoop project with all that contribution and contributors coming in across the board. So great history. Right. What's going on today? So what's the um, current we've situation? Got, you know, lots of um, lots of people still contributing, um, uh, both at Yahoo, at Facebook, um, uh, at lots of other companies um, uh, are, are involved in the project today. Um, uh, eBay, Twitter, you know, you name it. There's a, a, um, a suite of other technologies which are building up around the, this kernel 
of the, 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 the distributed file system in MapReduce. And on top of that, we're getting all sorts of query engines. Um, all, it's just a, a, a huge family of, of technologies um, growing up. And I think what we're seeing um, is people are realizing this is a new way of, of processing data um, uh, and um, uh, if lets them um, do things they couldn't do um, uh, at all before. Um, they, they can, they can, they can like, afford. What, like what examples would you say? Any, anything they can anecdotal? afford to save data that they couldn't afford to save before, that was just prohibitively expensive um, with, with conventional enterprise storage um, solutions. Um, if you want to just reliably be able to, to save, you know, for example, every transaction. Just in physical media and resource, people, right? Both kind of, both people and Yes, I mean, if, you, if you wanted to, to you know, uh, save every transaction um, that you saw and be able to have it online and ready, ready to process, um, ready to, to analyze um, at all times, and and save all the details of those transactions. Um, for a lot of businesses, that was just impractical. Um, yeah. And then to be able to do some having low latency too is a whole nother question, right? Not only storing it cost-wise, the latency issues of getting it back yeah. and processing. Right. It I mean, you could store it on tape maybe or something yeah. like that, but that's not that not very practical for. I mean, so we're living. So what you're saying basically is open source is great. Good stuff happening with Hadoop on the open source side. We'll, we'll drill more down into that. But on the, on the market side, we're talking about a real time environment. Things like Facebook, Twitter, mobility is creating all this new data. So in addition to the data that businesses could capture from a legacy standpoint, there's all new data. Right. So the requirements are high. Well, we've, you know? we've got, you know, we've got uh, banks and things like that, you know, and banks have a yeah. lot of transactional data. They've got ATMs, they've got credit cards, um, uh, they've got all kinds of, of, of financial information which they can, they can track and correlate um, and analyze and, you know, and learn about their customers, learn about markets, um, uh, learn about credit risks. Um, and it, it's all sorts of different industries. Um, you know, in healthcare, you can, uh, uh, you, there's lots of lots of data that comes in um, that you know used to either be discarded or not kept in an easily easy to use online form. Yeah, um, I mean a lot of companies. I, mean, I, I talked with the CEO of a company called ClickFox, Marco Pacelli out of New York. What he's done is he's used unstructured data and, and kind of the, the data uh, model to integrate all this data from call-in data, call mm -hmm. center data, mm -hmm. web data in real time process it and identify business value for the customers, his customers, to change processes. Right. Simple things like this person called in on the phone because they thought they forgot their password, but they really didn't forget their password, but they're still calling, they're getting hung up on. So all these like customer satisfaction things are like amazingly at being identified by data that was once stored and locked out on fence out tape. So this ClickFox company is doing extremely well. And his customers are saying, we've never had this kind of business engine before. Like real dashboard of like, hey, this is what our customers are doing. Like, and he was telling me that they could never do that before. So that is a, that is a pretty solid right. example of what you're saying, which is these new engines can come in, identify these problems. The other thing that it facilitates is doing um, ad hoc analyses. So you, you, so you can afford to save the data, um, but you can also afford to, um, uh, to save it all and run some computation over all of it. And it may not be hugely fast, but you can do it um, uh, and, and get it done. And you know, maybe it takes a half an hour, an hour, or even overnight. Um, uh, and that's tremendously enabling for people doing research. And, and you, know, you don't always know what you want to do with the data when you gather it. Um, yeah. uh, or you might change your mind. You might say, well, this is what we're doing with the data, but somebody has another idea tomorrow, and, and can we do this? Um, and if you can afford to save it all, and you've got a sort of general purpose engine uh, that, that can go and process it all, um, then you, you can figure out other things to do with it after the fact. Okay. And, and we see people taking advantage of that all the time. That's a, that's a, that's a huge uh, advantage. I, I think the old school way of doing things was you'd spend a lot more time upfront designing. You sort of say, um, what, you know, what, is the, 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 what is the question we're going to ask at the end of the day um, for our data? What are, you know, what are the set of questions that we want to be able to answer? Um, and, uh, and so we've got the data coming in. So let's transform the data before we load it in and filter it down to just those things which are required to answer these questions, and then we'll index it in just the way that we can quickly answer these questions later, and you build this very specific system for this one set of questions. But so the constraints decide, are amazing. You've got structural constraints, syntax. Right. So then, but then if you change the question you want to ask, then, oops, you've got to, you've got to go back and you've got to real, if, if you even were able to save the original data, yeah, if there's yeah. something you want to query that which you threw yeah. out, you, you know, you, you've, you're screwed. So highly inefficient, which is why this ClickFox example is interesting to me because what it opens up is, to exactly your point, these business um, intelligence or data warehouses were purpose-built for a 
cer certain set of questions. Right, right. Exactly. And a lot of this value is unpredictive type things that are ad hoc. Right. You know, identifying trends quickly and with the real time web, it becomes very yeah. interesting. Um, we're here at uh, Cloudera in the SiliconANGLE studios here in Palo Alto, California with Doug Cutting, one of the founders of the Hadoop project. Um, great inspiration to many folks in the computer science field. Um, Hadoop is one of the most popular, uh, growing, emerging technologies that is fueling a new innovation and revolution in business value and changing the data warehouse business as we know it and changing, quite frankly, society and benefits to society. Um, Doug, um, let's talk about computer science and um, for a minute. You've been an inspiration to a lot of folks out there, uh, young and old, around what you've done. I mean, you know, you've taken... Uh, some hacking, uh, an ambitious goal of building an open source search engine and transform that with, with a partner and got some momentum in a classic open source success story where it got momentum and you had stakeholders like Yahoo and Google contributing massive companies that had the same need grows into a big, big project. Um, a lot of folks want to know, younger folks in particular that I talked to, is how do, how do you do that? Like, you know, you know, you've been around the block, you've done a few things, you know, you have you had dupe and you're working on more. What's your advice to the folks out there who want to know, how do I get involved? How do I, how could I pull off something like that? Um, I mean, I think working on open source is a huge advantage. Um, I worked writing software at um, proprietary software companies for um, uh, a good 15 years before I started doing open source work. Um, and I don't think the quality of the, the software or even the, you know, how, how innovative it was was any different in those contexts. Um, but fewer people got to see it. And in some cases, you know, I worked for companies that went bankrupt and the software disappeared into, into an intellectual property black hole. Um, and um, when you're doing things that every, everyone can see, um, uh, then, you know, more people can use it. Um, and it, and it, it lives longer, it gets more exposure. Um, uh, and moreover, it's just um, people because it's people like free. Um, they can try it out. Um, you, you get uh, you sort of skunk works kind of projects. Uh, people don't go to their manager. They just download something because they yeah. can. It's free. They don't have to go and sign some sales agreement or you know do do something that requires a lot of approval and 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 thought. They can just download something. They can try something. They can build a prototype, yeah. um, uh, and they can evaluate it and see does this actually um, solve a need and. A lot of times what you find is it solves 90% of a need. And, but there's a little thing that would make, if they added this or they fixed this one thing here, um, uh, then it would be 100%. And so then they add that, and if they're smart, they give it back to the project um, so that it will, it will stay there. Um, so it will be there for, for other people and for them in the future. Um, uh, the other thing... Um, what did you uh, learn in that advantage, process? I want to get to another advantage of open source for them is when they have problems with it, um, they try something and it dies in some horrible way, they can easily go and see why it died because they've got all the code. And if they've got a question about it, there's a, a bunch of people out there who will answer the question for free. Um, and with proprietary software, I think it's a little harder to do that um, if you, you usually don't have the source. Someone could quit and leave the job, right? And they may not be around, um, yeah, for, for a lot of reasons. So I think people find it easier just to get started. Um, and then once they're going to, to modify it and get it to do what they want, um, uh, and so it's, it's, to me, it's been a, a, a huge improvement um, uh, working on open source over proprietary software. Um, what would you say to the folks out there from lessons learned? I mean, you've, you've had a, a, an interesting road. Or you've, you've had stumbled, probably hit your head against some stumbling blocks there. And, you know, and challenges always happen. You know, when you have growth, it's like a crying baby. You know, you, know, you got to fix things, right? So um, what would you share with folks out there for this kind of where you are now, where you've come from? Just some lessons learned, best practices. You know, what are the things that you um, share? Like, I've come to what appreciate. To avoid. I mean, I'm, I'm, I also, I, I, all the projects I work on are at the Apache Software Foundation. Um, uh, I'm currently the chair of the Apache Software Foundation. Um, and I've come to appreciate through the years um, the value that Apache brings. Um, Apache's worked out um, uh, a lot of uh, systems and um, uh, ways of operating open source projects that work well, um, uh, that, that um, uh, you, where you can get people who, um, who may have um, differences to work together and resolve those differences, um, uh, or decide to split up, uh, and it gives, gives you it gives you a legal structure. I think of it as um, uh, a sort of a, a civil society. It's it's like a government um, for software, um, uh, and I think it's it's. They've done than a good anarchy. job over the years. They've, um, they've created some good products, pretty stable products, good community, mm -hmm. very active. 
I mean, they have a good track record, obviously, web server from up from the web server days always forward. But but it's it's because the the reason that there are these high quality projects is because there's this um, bottom up. It's not it's not the top down. There's been somebody cracking the whip and saying you will produce great software. Rather, it's that there's a, a system that enables people um, to produce good software and encourages that um, in a bottom up manner. Um, it's it's a very very bottom up. Organization. What's going on at um, that gets you excited these days? Um, I see you're you're very busy. I see you're. you're you, you have a, a day job here at Cloudera, but you're actively working at Apache on the new stuff. Um, what's exciting for you these days? What are the projects you're got your fingers in and playing with? Well, it's exciting to see you know new versions of of Hadoop roll out um, and and all the surrounding projects that surround it um, and all the all the new things that people are able to do. Um, uh, we're um, working on getting out an, another major release of Hadoop um, uh, 0.22. Someday maybe we'll have 1.0, who knows. <laughs> um, uh, I spend most of my time um, when I'm writing software these days working on a project called Avro, um, trying to establish a standard data format that has a little, um, permits a little more introspection of the data yep. um, that's a uh, language independent format um, uh, that, so that the data can describe itself and people can uh, process it from lots of different applications. Um, I, I think we're... We're not, there's not quite the right data format out there yet, and I'm hoping Avro can prove to be that. Um, another related problem we have is, um, uh, is that the systems that these different um, uh, uh, components communicate with, um, uh, is currently, the cur ones we currently use in Hadoop are fragile. Um, uh, if you change things uh, on one side, then the other side may not be able to talk to it any longer, um, and, uh, and we, need to, we need to fix that. Um, uh, we need to get to the point where you can uh, smoothly upgrade different components independently um, uh, in these distributed systems. Um, and that's, that's an ongoing project to figure out how to do that. And, and uh, then it's going to be a, a massive effort to work that through all these projects. Um, Let me ask you a question. Um, it's more a philosophical question, so mm -hmm. you know, answer it however you'd like. Um, what has surprised you the most, what's going on today? Um, is there anything in particular you go, wow, that is an absolute you know, surprise? I mean, or in a, in a good way, it could be like, I didn't think, you can say, from I didn't think it was going to happen, or, well, I didn't think it would blow up and be that big. Yeah, is I, it? I, I think it's all surprised me. The, the, the success has been a, you know, pretty, I didn't anticipate that this was going to be a, a more than a technology to support an open source web search engine. Um, uh, that, that was what I was interested in. That's what we built it for. Um, the fact that it's... Um, of general utility, you know, doesn't isn't a total surprise, but you know, it's I didn't think it would be of, of this much general utility that it would be used in, uh, you know, insurance companies and banks and you yeah. know, in science and all kinds of things like that. That that wasn't something I anticipated. Uh, so it's been a, a very pleasant surprise. I talk to a lot of developers out there, and um, you know, from time to time, we talk about things like what's going on with things like OpenStack and you know, this, that, and the other thing, Hadoop, and you know, all these other proprietary vendor technologies and whatnot. And then you got people who are decision makers in these big banks and whatnot. But at the developer community, it's a little bit more fickle. People want to know, hey, you know, I want to like like an open source project. I want to work on something, and feel good about it, and not have it go away. And so there's a general feeling around developers to look for the hot thermals in the market where there's the good community growth, you know, like those areas that are just mm -hmm. getting sucked up with momentum. Is there anything that you could point to and say for the folks out there that are developers, like here's some projects that you're I, I, I seeing out there that are getting a lot of momentum that are worth getting behind? Because you know, a lot of times developers just want some stability around the community. Is it HBase? Is it, you know, Flume? Is it, you know, all these other momentum points? Is there anything out there that you could point to? Or worth I, I always to. think that people should work on something that solves a need they have. Um, you know, so I, I would think more about developers think about the application they want to build, um, and then look at the technologies that are out there and look what, which ones are closest to satisfying it. And part of that is, do they have an active community? I mean, if you've got a project which you know satisfies 80% of it, but it's dead, then that's a lot of effort to bring it back to life. If there's nobody working on it, you've got one that that only does you know 70%. But it's got a, a you know group of people who are you know working together well, who you know you, it's easy to get along with. Um, then that's a better one um, uh, be, because it's you know it's 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 got a future. Um, uh, so so that does play into it. Um, uh, the the you know the, the popularity and the activity of the community and all, all that sort of stuff. Um, but mostly, I think you, you need to have a you want to scratch your own itch. I think that's those the best changes come from people who have a real yeah. problem um, and want to solve it. Um, and then what open source tends to, to enforce is that you have to um, think be a little bit more general um, I, I see a lot more in when I when in my proprietary software days uh, people doing short-term fixes for a specific problem because they need to get it done they need to get on a schedule 
um, and they don't care if it's general purpose because uh, they're in a rush and nobody's going to criticize them. Um, yeah, they uh, met their deadline. Yeah. yeah. Um, whereas on an open source project, you've got other people at other companies who don't necessarily share that problem. And so they think about, well, how is this change? Could I take advantage of it? And even if I can't, how can I make it so that it doesn't impact me? Um, and so you, you get spent a little more time. A little uh, more QA involved. There's a little mm -hmm. bit a lot more QA you get involved. Get more eyes um, yeah. looking at it from different angles, different perspectives, different uses. Um, so it's it's even it's not just um, QA. I mean, it's a particular kind of QA um, uh, where, where people are, are trying to. I mean, it's because you're trying to build uh, something collaboratively that's shared. Um, you have more perspectives because um, uh, there's there's a, a diverse set of users. Um, uh, I actually have to run. Okay, we're Doug, here at Doug assembly. Cutting here as the run. Uh, thank you for coming on the Extraction Point. Really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for your insight. We look forward to talking further about Apache and uh, the projects and getting more folks in here to talk about Hadoop. Appreciate your, your uh, time. It's fun to be here. Thanks. Uh, I look forward to doing it again. Okay. Bye-bye. That's a wrap, Ricky.